In this edition of Train Spotting, we meet the men behind the world's most famous locomotive. I have the dream job of travelling to Scotland aboard the Caledonian Sleeper, and while Found makes it no further than Metroland, I take the high road. Well, all right, the railway. To the Kyle of Lockalsh. To my mind, there are three great British artists. There's Constable, there's Turner, and there's Sir Nigel Gresley. Yeah, Nigel Gresley. You see, when one man is capable of producing something as beautiful and as wonderful as this, it's no longer engineering, it's art. She was the first engine for the new LNER railway company, the first engine to appear in their new green, as she still appears today. Uh, and in 1924 and uh, on the following years, she appeared in the Empire Exhibition as the epitome of the best engineering that the London and North Eastern Railway could produce. After that, it's history really, she happened to be the locomotive uh, which was chosen to run the first ever non-stop service from King's Cross in London to Waverley Station in Edinburgh. It was a very competitive field then, it was like the rivalry between railways and aeroplanes now. She went there, she did it non-stop, became instantly even more famous, and then she became the very first locomotive genuinely to be timed at 100 miles per hour, famous again. And then came 1963, by which time she'd run 2 million miles for uh, railways, eventually British Rail, in four or five different liveries, including wartime black and uh, the darker green of British Rail. And then she became the first to be sold out to be used for pulling uh, private halls. Well, the locomotive itself weighs 98 tonnes and the tender weighs 62 tonnes. So together, uh, that's in service condition, together they weigh 160 tonnes. Um, the um, locomotive is, uh, uh, was built as a racehorse, the whole class were known as racehorses. And in the 1920s and early 30s, they were the top class engine on the East Coast Main Line. I left school in 1955 and started as an engine cleaner at Wakefield Engine Sheds, uh, cleaning steam engines on the outside and all the rods and so on. And it's by far the best way to get to know about them. You have to clean every individual bit, you get to know what it is. Uh, and uh, I went on then to be a fireman, but it was all sort of coal trains across the Pennines, and I fancied a bit more than that. So I transferred to Leicester on the Midland Main Line and worked and worked up to working expresses between St Pancras and Leeds and Manchester. Um, at this stage, it's, uh, it's tea time on Friday, and we're, we're out in, uh, fairly early in the morning on Saturday, so we've got to make sure everything is right tonight before we've finished. Um, that involves uh, checking the systems, it involves me doing what is known as a fitness to run examination, which means I've got to go all over the machine to make sure that there's nothing broken, nothing dropping off, nothing fractured, no nuts and bolts loose, that it is in fact fit to go out on rail track tomorrow. Yeah, um, well, although it, it was a job everybody liked in, in days when BR operated steam, there were a lot of drawbacks, but the thrill and exhilaration of working a passenger train, or even a heavy freight train, and doing it well, particularly the firing, it gave you a buzz. There's no two ways about it. Uh, and that is what I still get out of the job. It's this buzz, the, the raw power of the thing. And there's only two men, one providing the power, one controlling it. Both satisfactory jobs. And I still get a thrill from that. Well, having been the first non-stop to Edinburgh, the first 100 mile an hour, the first to go around the world, she's now the first, I think, to be owned by a public company whose sole purpose is the running, maintaining, and showing of the Flying Scotsman. Uh, she was in private ownership from 1963, having been previously British Rail and before that London North Eastern Railway. She was owned first by Sir Alan Pegler in 63, and then later bought by Sir William McAlpine uh, and Pete Waterman. She was then bought by Dr Tony Marchington and then she went into a company, Flying Scotsman Railways Limited. And earlier in 2002, Flying Scotsman Railways Limited became a public company on which shares are traded on the Offex uh, Stock Exchange in London. Uh, and everybody can own a slice of this enormously important piece of British history. It's a big lump of metal and it's one which I have to keep running. But having said that, I wouldn't do what I do with it and, and having done it for 17 years, I wouldn't do it if I didn't have a feeling for it as well. But one has to uh, put aside those feelings from time to time and, uh, and just make sure it's capable of doing the job.
well, I have to say it's become a way of life. Yeah, it has. It really has. I really wonder whether I ought to sort of uh, start slowing down a bit now, but um, it's still got this fatal attraction. I'm afraid I just, I just can't keep away from it. All of the steam engineers is iron and steel, coal, water, one match, and man's imagination. Uh, we think the Flying Scotsman is a tremendous piece of engineering. The motive power, uh, the durability, uh, the sheer guts this thing has got, added to the fact that you tell me whether it's artistry or, or whether it's engineering, it's just a beautiful thing. Now for those of you who know London, you might recognise this. This is Euston. The station was built here in 1837, but before it was built, all this area was just fields, in fact, farmed by Cecil Rhodes, the founder of Rhodesia. Now, the London to Birmingham Railway had two proposals for a terminus in London. The first one was at the Strand, the second one was at Marble Arch. But there was so much public opposition to this, they were shoved up here to Euston Square, where the poor people lived. Now, the station we've come to know and Love was actually finished in 1968. Electric trains, though, started running out of here in 1966, and the line to Glasgow was eventually electrified in 1974. Now, tonight I'm making one of the classic British railway journeys from London Euston to the Kyle of Loch Elsh. And the first part of my journey is the overnight sleeper to Inverness, and it's just come up on the board. ScotRail run four sleepers a night, two heading north and two heading south. This Class 90 will be hauling all 16 coaches of my train, known as the Highlander. Hello, uh, Coach J17. Hey, you'd like to follow me? Okay. Have you travelled with us on this slipper before, sir? Uh, no, this is the first time and oh. I'm thoroughly looking forward to Wonderful. it. Wonderful. I'll show you where you are. You're number 1718 and if you'd just like to step in with me, okay. I'll show you a few facilities within the berth. So this is my home for the night. Just put my bag up here, up there like that. Got my sink here with hot and cold running water. And this desk comes up, give me a bit more leg space. Now there's a, a bunk above me here which folds down if there's a second person in the cabin with you and that's their breakfast tray just there. And by the side of the bed here, all these buttons and knobs to twiddle during the night. You've got a berth light, the main light, uh, there's a buzzer for the attendant if you need him during the night and a temperature control as well. Do you know what? I think I'm going to be very comfortable here. Wow, this is the way to travel. This is the first class lounge carriage. We're just about to leave London Euston now. I'm sitting down at my table and I wonder what single malts they have on offer tonight. Now, Willie Black, your customer services manager for ScotRail. Yep. Um, what's the history of the sleeper between London and Scotland? When did it first start running? 1873, I think, was the first service it's ran, and it's continued since then through, obviously, a variety of private companies, through nationalisation, through British Rail, and then that sequence has continued back into the private sector. Is there still a demand for sleeper service? Absolutely, there's still a demand. Uh, the main market we get is a mixture between in the business market to get into the centre of London for 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, a lot of business from the lowland area, business to the highlands, and overlapping with that is obviously the tourist market, which is a more and more uh, a portion of, of the sleeper market. Uh, Paul Carpenter, your yeah. chief steward. Yeah. How long have you been doing this job? Over 20 years now. How many trips do you do a week? On an average two, down, two back. Per week, so per how many week. hours is that? Roughly about 56 hours. Do you sh shut service, at a certain time? Service all night. They have tea, coffee through the night, and we're down at beck and call for the passengers and the sleepers as well. So when do you get to sleep? Uh, when I get home. No? Yeah. Really? Yeah, permanent night shift. This is what it's all about, being lulled to sleep by the gentle motion of a train. Good night. <laughs> Stop laughing, you. <laughs> Good morning. Just finishing off my coffee that was brought to my cabin earlier on. Nice touch of service there. Now, currently, we're between Aviemore and Inverness. Earlier on this morning, at about 
four o'clock at Edinburgh. The train split into three parts, <clears throat> one section for Inverness, one for Fort William and one for Aberdeen. They took the Class 90 off the front of the train, which we had all the way from Euston, and then put a Class 67 on, of course, because there's no electrification north of Edinburgh and up the Highland Line itself to Inverness. It's 118 miles between Perth and Inverness, mostly single track. So we keep having to stop to let 125s and sprinters actually pass us at certain points on this line. But I'd say Inverness is about 15 minutes away. So here we are, Inverness. Part one of my epic journey is done. What a great job this is. Inverness Station, first opened to the public in 1858. Now then, the 1048 to the Carle of Lockhouse, as you can see on the board, says Platform 1. Should be uh, just coming in now, go and check it out. So this is the Class 67 that brought me in this morning on the overnight sleeper from the Edinburgh part. And this Class 158 two-car unit is going to be the one that takes me to the Carlo Lockhouse on the second part of my journey. Just before we set off, I managed to have a quick chat with our driver, Don. Because you were driving, what, Class 37s on this route as well? 37s, yeah. When I started the job uh, 17 years ago, it was 37s then, and uh, now we've got the 158s. And how do these 158s compare with the 37? The 158 is a lot better for the line, it's a lot lighter. Let me tell your media relations manager for ScotRail, yeah. um, what's the history of the line between Inverness and Carlow? Well, it started around about uh, 1870 when the Dingwall and uh, Sky Railway attempted to reach Kyle of Lacalche, uh, but unfortunately they ran out of money uh, by the time they got to Strome Ferry, so that became the terminal point for another 27 years. Uh, and it wasn't until 1897 that the line to Sky, uh, to Kyle of Lacalche, uh, was finally reached. Because it's always been plagued by money problems, really, hasn't it? I think there's been a history of uh, threatened closures and one of the positive things about railway privatisation is that it's guaranteed the future of uh, many lines like this for the length of the franchise and beyond. Some of the stops on the line are, uh, are request stops as well, aren't they? That's right, yeah. You ask the uh, conductor to stop for you. A bit like a taxi service in the rural community. Now this is Strom Ferry, originally the end of the line because they ran out of money. But then, thanks to a quarter of a million pounds from the illicit opium trade, they managed to blast their way through in 1897, the ten and a half miles to the Kyle of Lockhouse. If you're ever up this way, it's worth popping into the station at Kyle to visit the museum run by the Friends of the Kyle Line. I spoke to one of their members, Dave Voicy. So currently, you've got these. Class 158 units running the mm -hmm. line at the moment. What sort of locos would have been used when the line first opened over 100 years ago? Right, the Highland Railway uh, had their own locomotive built. Um, this was colloquially known as the Sky Bogey. A very attractive little engine, mm. a very good workhorse that work, worked this line, usually hauling mixed trains from Inverness out to here. And were they built specially for this line? Apparently, yes. Oh, right. mm. And what about the high points and the low points of the line? The high points, I think, were the days when Kyle was the major terminus. All the traffic for the Western Isles went from here. And what about uh, the low points? I mean, I suppose you're often getting cut off from uh, <laughs> civilization, so we call it, Inverness, um, by snowdrifts? No, we don't. You don't? No, nope, the West Coast has a remarkably mellow climate. It's, oh. it's typical Gulf Stream country. It's very soft, very warm. East Coast, different matter altogether. So how would you sum up the Kyle Line. Beauty. Impressive. Seeing the whole of Scotland on just one railway line. As you come out of Dingwall, soft country, country and farmland, then up into, climbing up into the mountains, 
through Aknesheen, Bleak, Wild, Moorland, down the glens, and eventually come down to the waterside. We get miles of water, seabirds, wildlife to look at, the island stretching out into the distance as you approach Kyle, and eventually Kyle itself. And here at the end of the line, we've got Sky and the Sky Bridge. Now this is a bit of an extra added bonus. If you've made the journey to the Kyle of Lockhouse, like I have, and you've got a spare 15p in your pocket, then you can take the bus from the centre of Kyle, over there, across the brand new road bridge to the Isle of Skye. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, what a fantastic trip it's been. But you'll be pleased to hear that I'm not travelling home alone. In the guards van, there's a special compartment that's been created by ScotRail for a nightly consignment of shellfish. Now, for what amounts to a token payment, ScotRail have managed to secure 30 jobs in this particular area for local fishermen. And this also ensures that London's finest restaurants will have Scotland's finest shellfish on their tables tomorrow lunchtime. One would have thought that any story about the Metropolitan Line must surely begin at Baker Street. It's the oldest, the largest, and in my humble opinion, one of the nicest of the underground stations. So, it does beg the question, what on earth are we doing in Covent Garden? Any research for anything to do with the underground must surely start here, the London Transport Museum in Covent Garden. And who better to ask than Oliver Green, the head of the collection? It was a hell of an undertaking, wasn't it? I mean, there were no tunnelling shields or anything like that in those days. They just dug up the road, dug a trench, um, put a, a, a brick arch roof over it and reinstated the road service and left gaps at various points for the steam to escape. OK, and well, I was, I was just going to say, it must have been quite hellish uh, down in those tunnels in those days because this was the sort of locomotive that was hauling that, the trains, wasn't it? That's right. I mean, this is the only survivor of the, the very first underground railway in the world, which was the Metropolitan Railway in London, opened in 1863. The original locomotives, such as, as this, had what's called condensing apparatus on the side, which is a big pipe which takes as much as possible of the steam from the cylinders along uh, and, and dumps it in a, a big tank of cold water on the side of the locomotive. The reality was that I think it, it wasn't very effective and so it was a pretty sulphurous and unpleasant atmosphere in those tunnels. All right, well the Metropolitan Line, presumably that line was very successful. Um, they, they had greater pretensions than that though, didn't they? Fairly quickly the, the Metropolitan Railway realised that they were actually going to make more money by extending the line out overground. Uh, through the suburbs and out into the countryside. Now, you've got an example of, of one of the carriages that they would have used on this extension out. This uh, has got a Rickmansworth uh, signboard on it. Is it a carriage? Would it have been pulled by that locomotive there? Those locomotives were actually used on, on the initial extension line, but yes, this would be in the sort of coach that was used on the outer Metropolitan Line from the 1890s right through, in fact, until the 1960s when uh, it was finally modernised with new electric trains. Can we sit in it? Sir. Do you mind? Um, Metroland. That was a metropolitan railway idea, wasn't it? It was. Most railway companies, once they built the line, they just disposed of all the surplus property alongside. The Metropolitan hit on the quite brilliant idea that they'd hang on to the, the property and they'd actually build their own housing estates close to the stations in what they then, again, astutely christened Metroland. That was a, the name that they came up with their publicity department in 1915, obviously encouraging people to move out of inner London, out to these lovely new suburban houses on the and edge of the countryside. travel back in again. Travel back in. So all, all round, they made money on, on the deal. It was a brilliant concept. But they, they went even further than that, really, didn't they, in, in their pretensions uh, they to did. be a major railway in force? They did. The, the chairman at the end of the 19th century is a man called Sir Edward Watkin, and he was chairman, of, as well as the Metropolitan, of a number of other railway companies, including an involvement in the original Channel Tunnel project, which was started at that time but never completed. And Watkins' ambition was to actually have a series of railways all under his chairmanship, which would link Manchester and Paris. And he got pretty close to it, actually. Do you know, I could genuinely spend all day here. Absolutely fascinating. But for now, it's off to Baker Street, Watson. There's mischief afoot. Come on. Dear, oh dear, Sherlock Holmes, a cheap gag for me or a genuine connection? 
genuine connection actually, read Kernan Doyle's short Sherlock Holmes story, The Bruce Parkinson Plans, and you'll find a very detailed description of the Metropolitan Line in it. Oh, by the way, it was no accident. I bet you think I'm going to get on a train. Wrong. I'm going to go to the control room to meet Signalman Darren, Darren Lucas. Nice to meet you. Um, well, what are we looking at here? Right, the diagram you can see in front of you represents the area that we control here at the Signal Control Centre. Yeah. It's the original part of the Jubilee line before they extended it to Stratford. Right. Plus the Metropolitan line, which runs from Allgate in the city through to where we finish controlling it at Wembley Park. All oh, right, what happens beyond then? Beyond Wembley Park, it goes back to the, the older methods of signalling control that we had, which is signal cabin based control. Right. And the next signal cabin up from there is Harrow on the Hill. OK, right, and, that, and this presumably is, is what replaced those signal cabins all the way into the city. Now, if I'm reading this correctly, there's a train just coming into Baker Street there, isn't there? Is there any chance of just holding that for me? Now, I can't see very much out there at the moment, but this is an interesting part of the line. Originally, this was the Metropolitan and St John's Wood Railway. Curious affair, it was a single line with a passing loop and operated a human token system. One chap wearing a red cap and one chap wearing a blue cap. You had to have the right chap with the right cap travelling on your footplate before you could proceed. Of course, the Dutch operated a similar system. I told you they'd never let you say that. Yeah, and they never let me do my poem either, my tribute to John Betjeman's Metroland. Do you want to hear it? No. I was on my way home from a dinner when the train stopped just outside Pinner. I found an old suite, stuck to the seat, and I sucked it until it was thinner. Idiot. Four letters, rhymes with hat. <laughs> <laughs>